Father heaven, I thank you for this day and for our time together. Um, it's good to be among brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, Father, it's um, always fun. It's just frankly fun to open up your word and to learn new things, to see what it is that you have to say to us and to enjoy this process. Uh, I think sometimes um, some believers struggle with uh, Bible study because they just uh, get caught up in all the details, but at the end of the day, we're just trying to hear from you, and so when we open up your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, teach us, um, help us to see things maybe we haven't seen before, um, help us to see different views, and um, understand uh, important truths, and, uh, and we just ask for that continual guidance today. Um, I thank you for each person here on this uh, Zoom call. Pray for those who are not able to be uh, with us today and uh, for our church family, God, as we continue to um, deal with the things that are happening within our world, this COVID-19 coronavirus situation we find ourselves within, we continually just look for you, uh, look to you for all of our answers. And um, so we thank you um, that you give us uh, peace, a peace that uh, transcends all understanding. Um, and while the world is looking for peace, uh, we can find it. We have that. Uh, that's available in your son. And so we thank you and just ask for your blessing upon our time today and pray all this in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Uh, Revelation chapter 20. Let's recap where we were last week. Um, Obviously, uh, that was a big chapter. Um, I apologize. Uh, hey, Elena. Hi, Elena. Hey, baby. Hey, Elena. Uh, we just prayed, and we were getting ready to talk about uh, recapping uh, Revelation chapter 20. I was just saying uh, before you jumped on that um, last week's chapter was a big chapter, lots that we discussed. Um, I apologize if I... Um, I was thinking about later, if I spoke too much, I was trying to just bring out uh, as much information about the different perspectives as, as, um, as I could, but sometimes that doesn't always lead to discussion. So if that, if you felt that, um, I apologize for that, hopefully today will be a little bit better. Um, but with regard to chapter 20, if you have your notes, um, tell me some things that you learned um and uh help me to let's recap what was found in chapter 20 the thousand years any thoughts there well josh um, is an all millennial no, just uh, <laughs> <laughs> i got that it was like yes. drilled into me just kidding i love you Yes, I am. I love you. Good You're for perfect. bad. I'm I'm an all millennial. I'm a partial preterist, and so uh, when we get into Revelation 21, I do not take a preterist perspective on this one. Huh. But, uh, other parts of Revelation I do, and so we'll talk about why that is. But um, very good. Um, chapter 20 dealt with the different millennial views, like and like Lana said, one of them is a millennial. Um, no millennials, so we're living in the thousand years. Some take a premillennial view, others a postmillennial view. Um, and um, if you remember uh, some of the details, the, the first portion um, talked about the binding of Satan, and then the second portion was all about what would happen as he was bound. And we talked about when that uh, may have taken place and different views of that. The final portion was really about the judgment and um, things that happen in the end. Um, some good es eschatology, last times, end times, um, things that take place. Uh, and one of the key things was in verse 11, you know, when it says that um, John saw a great white throne, uh, and him who was seated on it from his presence, the earth and sky fled away. And so this is going to be what leads us to the need for a new heavens, new earth, right? If the old has passed, uh, that, that's going to necessi necessitate a new. Uh, anything from last week that uh, you re recall, things that stood out? Obviously, there was a lot uh, that we talked about, but... So it seems well, 
final, final, final judgment has taken place. <clears throat> all the dead and living, great and small, were all judged, and anybody who did not, whose name was not written in the Book of Life, was uh, thrown into the lake of fire. So it, even though in some of the previous chapters it feels like the judgment had occurred, but then all of a sudden we're seeing more judgment, and it's really just different perspectives, it seems, of the same judgment occurring. It seems to be really final this time. It's like, okay, we're done. Every the the wheat has been sorted from the chaff, and so now we have all the God's believers um, who have been uh, pulled aside for eternity. Yep. Okay. Very good. Any other thoughts before we jump into twenty one? Can, can I get a quick summary, uh, just a recap of what we talked about in regard to the first resurrection and kind of what the, um, I don't know why I can't remember what we talked about. <laughs> because you're verse just five. a baby. I'm just a little baby. <laughs> verse, verse five, are you referring to? What yeah, the yeah, 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 four through six. Yeah, so remember the premillennial view is that, um, Jesus returns, and then we have the rapture. The dead in Christ come um, up and they, to be with God, and then Jesus establishes a thousand-year reign, and then he returns. And so the first resurrection in that view would be those who are uh, the righteous, the, the traditional view of the rapture, yeah. um, the things that are seen in the uh, movie or books, um, when uh, the Left Behind series, when you see or hear about, you know, um, I remember reading that book or a portion of that book, and uh, one of the things that happened was a, uh, uh, a bunch of people were in an airplane, and the pilot was taken raptured, you know, instantly, and the plane's going down, and all the people are on board, and what are you going to do, because the pilot's been raptured, you know, and uh, there's, you know, but it's the idea that the righteous are taken into heaven and then others are left on earth. And so that's one view that would be the premillennial, the amillennial or, or the, another perspective of that would be that the first resurrection is a spiritual resurrection. The okay, second that, would be okay. physical. Okay. And so that's the idea that you were raised from the dead spiritually in baptism and when you gave your life to Christ, and then the second resurrection is going to be um, a physical one that occurred. Gotcha. Um, in the second, so the second death, when they talk about second death, Revelation chapter 20 and verse uh, 14, later in verse uh, chapter 21 and verse 8, that idea of a second death is the spiritual death. So a person can die physically. But um, the second death is that eternal uh, suffering in which you are eternally separated from God. Gotcha. So, <clears throat> thank you. Oh, sorry, I had a, just a follow up to the premillennial view, um, because you know we talk. You talked about how Jesus will, or you know, Jesus establishes his reign and then returns again. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm having trouble understanding how a king would come in, establish a kingdom and then leave. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, it seems like if he, if he came to establish a kingdom, he would stay there to rule the, to rule the kingdom. Is that not right? Um, yeah. Well, I believe he does stay, but the believers leave. Oh, the, okay. Okay. Um, well, no, he doesn't. Well, that's what I'm saying, because he would leave and then come again. Yeah. Um, what verse are you looking at? He's just speaking of. That. I don't know. What, what, I think he does leave. I believe he establishes the kingdom in that moment, and then uh, that kingdom is on earth um, for a thousand years. For a thousand and years. When, yeah, and then that's when they set up uh, where you get that, you know, king. From what maybe I understand that. That's who King David starts ruling, maybe, for the thousand years. I don't know. Um, 
I don't know. I, I my understanding is he does leave Alex, but he must leave yeah. something in place to. Well, okay, hold on, hold on a minute. Okay, <laughs> but aren't we? If this is what we're living in right now, the millennium. Yeah. Then he's here. He hasn't left. The Holy Spirit's here. Yeah. So right? maybe it's the same idea. Yeah. Maybe right? it's. Maybe it's just a matter of when did he establish it? He's he's still reigning, still mm -hmm. here, but um, but not physically here. Well, I think Alex huh. started by saying he was trying to better understand the premillennial view. And yeah. the premillennial view would be that the first resurrection is followed by a thousand years. And, and the first resurrection is the kind of the full, it's the, what's the term, um, rapture. Then it's followed by a thousand years and then Jesus comes again. So if he's coming again, that would sort of indicate he's not living with earth. Right. I mean, he, he's with us in spirit, but not yeah. physically living on the earth. Right. And right. So, so I think Alex's point was, that seems kind of weird because if he establishes kingdom, why would he go away for a thousand years before he came back? Right. Did I get that? Right. Yeah. Why would he establish a kingdom and then immediately leave <laughs> for a thousand years? Uh, and then, you know, like you said, he must leave someone, uh, some sort of predecessor to rule the kingdom. Uh, That's great. Well, so. hmm. you know. Yeah, I don't think the Bible says it on any of that, but that would be why you might question the premillennial view. Questions like that might cause you to say, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, yeah, and I think the the I, if I arguing for the premillennial, I think the premillennial would probably say that he doesn't need to be physically here on Earth, and so I think the argument is really when did the king when is his when is the thousand year reign going to begin? Right, and uh, the amillennial would state that it's already begun, and the premillennial would say no, it's still to come. Oh. Still is going to take place in the future, and um, so I don't know that either of them argue for Jesus or someone physically being representative of the sitting on the throne on earth that you view, you can see. I think they both would say that um, it's, a, it's still a spiritual reality. Okay. Um, but it's a good question and I don't, um, I don't know um, too much beyond that. That's, if you find out some things and learn anything about that, I'd be curious to, to know myself. So, yeah. I'm no expert on Revelation. <laughs> I have had a class, so that makes me an expert, I guess. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> A uh, great question and great thoughts. There's a, a lot that Revelation uh, brings out, and um, uh, and it just causes us to continue to study and continue to look and dig. And um, I think that's good. Nothing but positive there. Uh, all right. So uh, chapter 20 then begin or finishes with that uh, judgment and. Um, the resurrection, there's a, the, there's a second resurrection at the end of chapter 20, which is why the premillennial would argue that the first resurrection is for the righteous and the second occurs after the, the rain, a thousand years. Um, but um, we, we talked about what that can, could be. Um, but it, w w at the end of 20, there is this resurrection. Um, death and Hades are destroyed. Um, those not found in the book of life are thrown into the lake of fire, uh, second death, spiritual death, all these things do take place. And so at the end of that, we have chapter 21. So to take uh, this chapter, let's take a look at, um, there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. And uh, then there's going to be a new Jerusalem. Um, and so let's take uh, the first portion and then we'll take the second so let's take a look at verses 1 through 8 first, and then we'll take a look at um, the rest of 21 and the first five verses of 22. 
Um, some of these details and some of the uh, things that we'll take a look at, uh, I don't have a ton of information on, but I'll share what I do know. So uh, let's take a look at uh, 21, one through eight. Would anyone like to read that for us? I can read it. All right. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his, this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Okay, thank you, Denise. Okay, so um, new heaven and new earth. Before we jump into the details, let's just think biblically uh, for a moment. Uh, let's be big, good Bible scholars. Why is um, this here? What, if you think about the Bible as a whole, why is the new heavens and the new earth necessary? <laughs> Because the earth is still it, it is in sin too from the first beginning. It got not like God made it. So we have to have a new heaven and a new earth because it's all messed up. Okay, good. And would anyone like to add to that? Well, it also fulfills prophecy. Um, in Isaiah 51 6, it talks about that this will happen okay yeah it fulfills prophecy the only other thing i would add is that it restores the garden of eden it restores the original purpose um, design and purpose right yeah very good when you look at the bible as a whole it begins genesis 1 and 2 with a perfect world god has created uh, a world that is perfect, um, and that, that was uh, heavens, earth, everything mm -hmm. was created. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good, you know, we read in um, Genesis uh, 1 and 2, and, uh, and then, of course, Genesis chapter 3 comes in the fall and sin, and uh, we discover that the earth is corrupt, mankind is corrupt. Mm -hmm. Paul tells us in the book of Romans that even the heavens become um, uh, marred or um, yeah. affected, right, by the sin uh, that has now mm -hmm. come into the world. And so uh, we, when we come to the end of the book of Revelation, we're kind of coming all the way back to the beginning. And so from Revelation, or excuse me, from Genesis 3 forward, what the Bible teaches us is that God is trying to get us back to the way things were, get us back to, to uh, the way he had originally created yeah. And everything um, from Genesis 3 forward is about getting us back to the way God had created uh, things in the first place. And so by the time we get to the Revelation 21, we finally see this happening. And the promise of a Messiah and Jesus coming into the world to suffer and die for our sins and, and all of that restoration that comes in the new kingdom and the new life that we have in him and all those things that that are new, being made new are all in preparation for um, this new um, dwelling place that we're going to be within. And so we were created to be on earth, not to float up in the clouds uh, in, in heaven. And so we're going to be given a new place to, to dwell. We're not going to be in a, uh, a place that's uh, different um, 
in, in the sense of location, but different certainly in the way in which it's recreated. It's going to be perfect. Um, that's, and um, you see through all through these details, right? Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, verse three. And so you think about the garden and how Adam and Eve had that perfect relationship with God. There was no fear. God could walk and they could see him, hear him, talk to him. There's no, uh, that relationship was uh, perfect and beautiful. Um, that's all taking place. It's all, we're all coming back to the way things began. You know, I love the fact that he is our good, good father, because all through the Bible, as any good father teaches their children, he gives you an example. This is what it's going to look like. This is, and so we kind of in our being with the Holy Spirit have an idea of what it's going to look like because he's already set this pattern for us. Even if you look at the temple, how he wanted the temple built in a very specific way, completely reflects who he is for eternity and that's pretty cool because we're just babies and we need to have these wonderful patterns set out for us in the bible isn't that precious yeah. absolutely yes um okay so let's begin kind of walking through this and let's make some observations about what this is going to look like what we see um what do you see as, as it opens up in verses uh, one through four? What are some of the details that stand out to you about um, the new heavens, the new earth, and what takes place here? Well, that it was coming down out of heaven. Okay, yeah, the new uh, Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. I think it's important to go ahead and point out here, too, that John sees the new city as a bride adorned for her husband. Well, we know from lots of passages in the New Testament that that's the church. And so when we get down to the new Jerusalem um, in verses 9 through 27, rest of the chapter, that's a description of the church, and uh, we'll see that more and more when we get to that point. But even here, uh, we see that this new city, um, and notice too, it's coming down yeah. out of heaven. And so it's coming to dwell on earth. Uh, now that this, you know, now that um, the new heavens and new earth is created and all sin is wiped away, nothing evil is upon the earth. Now God can come and dwell in a new way, right? Yeah. Uh, and even when we see the new Jerusalem later, there'll be no temple. There's no need for a temple because he's right there with us. Right. Um, and so all these things points to God coming down. He came down in the form of Jesus and in, in the form of a man, but now he's coming down to dwell among us uh, in a brand new way, in, a, in, in the ultimate uh, way. And... Um, and again, John, John saw, when he saw this holy city coming down, he recognized it as the new Jerusalem. And as we go on through 21, you, ha you have uh, almost the very same structure of the old Jerusalem with the, the 12 gates and the yeah. walls. And, and uh, so he recognized it. Oh, this is what it was supposed to look like the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and it's a um, picture of God's people um, shown here as a city, but um, yeah, okay, yep. I'm pondering um, for a minute, and I'm not sure I know how to think about this, but when you look at the Old Testament, you see a series of covenants that God has made with people, with Abraham and with um, David, you know, and then, you know, Jesus came and it fulfilled the old covenants and there was a new covenant. And so now, you know, when I look at the phrase, um, the first earth has passed away and the sea was no more. I mean, that could be literal, uh, but spiritually speaking too, does this mean the, 
prior covenant has gone away because there's a whole new deal again. So I'm trying to think of it in covenant terms and I'm not sure quite what I'm trying to say or how to think about that, but <clears throat> does this establish a new covenant or covenants no longer needed? Or the fulfillment of yeah. the covenant. <clears throat> well, a covenant is a, um, a relationship built upon a, a promise between two parties. And so, yeah, the, uh, there's no need for co future for covenants now because the two are um, completely in line. So uh, I don't think we really see a need for a anything beyond yep. the new covenant of the New Testament. <clears throat> it's been fulfilled. Yeah. I'm looking up a word here because... Um, it's interesting, uh, verse 3 says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be his people. Of course, that's found throughout the Bible, but um, your footnotes tell you that um, it can be translated as tabernacle. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with God. Mm -hmm. God tabernacled with his people. And um, I think it's the same Greek word that we read in John 1.14, um, where it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mm. I'll double check that, but um, that verb in John 1.14 is um, a verb which means to settle, to pitch a tent, to take up residence, or dwell as if in a tent. Um, six, 46, hmm. seven. Let me go look at this. <laughs> Place or abode is what my, um, little note says here. A taber tabernacle means a place or a bo of abode, a place to live. Yeah. It's like God, um, pitched a tent with his people. Mm -hmm. With his people. Uh, he, he, to, to, if you go camping with your family, it's a very close, intimate uh, dwelling place, right? Okay. It's uh, mm -hmm. that That's kind of very idea. cool. <laughs> um, One other versus temple, you think is kind of standoffish, but tabernacle saying, hey, we're all going to get in the tent. Right. Um, Another thing I just noticed in verse three, <clears throat> the loud voice. So the loud voice is coming from the th throne, which you assume then is God, yet then he begins talking about himself in third person. <clears throat> which he does, you know, he talks about himself in first person in other places in the Bible. Well, he is three people. <laughs> one of those other people. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, too, that the translate, translators don't put this in red letters. Um, so they're viewing it as God the Father, which it may well have been. But you're right. It, um, <clears throat> it does speak of him in the third person. <clears throat> Uh, but of course, it could have been uh, an angel or a voice right. from the, the, the area of the throne, or around the throne, or near the throne, declaring for God what, um, right. uh, what is happening here. <clears throat> but that same, just so you know, that is the same word, um, exact same word in the Greek language, uh, dwelling place. Um, is John one fourteen? So um, it's just huh. an interesting way of thinking about it. Yeah, and Denise, in verse three, where it says the loud voice from the throne. Yeah, and then later in verse five, it says he who was seated on the throne. I don't know if that uh, is some kind of distinction that you know in three where you know, from the throne, from the area of the throne, around the throne, versus being seated on the throne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the point 
obviously being that God is going to come and dwell among us um, in a new way. Um, in John, uh, obviously, um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us or tabernacled among us. Same I idea. And, and so G Jesus, uh, the word became Christ, became the Messiah, became Jesus. And he dwelt among his people. But yet, um, this is an even more intimate form of it, right? Because here, uh, God is dwelling uh, with all of his people. And, um, uh, and he's going to be with all uh, of his people same time. Jesus was dwelling within a, a human body. And so he was only able to, to be in a certain place at a certain time. And um, so it's, a, it's similar, but a little bit different in my mind, at least. More intimate here. Uh, verse four says that uh, he, God, will wipe away every tear. Death shall be no more. Um, neither shall there be mourning nor pain, etc. Um, remember, I, I had said, even though I'm uh, a preterist, I'm a partial preterist. Yeah. And here's why. Because a full preterist would say that the new Jerusalem that's going to be described represents um, the church from AD 70 forward or the, the church that was formed. However, you look at details like this, God mm -hmm. wiping away every tear mm -hmm. from the eyes, death shall be no more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a full preterist may argue, well, death, the, you know, in its ultimate form, well, may not be there. Okay. But it also says there's no pain. There's no mourning. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me points to this future church that is, um, uh, part of the, the last day. So uh, that's why I say I don't follow that full interpretation. I struggle with how that could be. There's a bunch of other details, but here we start to see already uh, some real challenges to that kind of thinking. Yeah, because I sure am painting. We got pain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Verse five says, um, God mm -hmm. says, I'm making all things new. You might recall how Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5 17, we're new, made new in Christ. Old has gone, new has come. And so we are made new in Christ um, when we are saved, when we give our lives to Him. But here, all things are being made, made new. <laughs> That's an awesome promise. Yeah, and I love that they're being made new. They're not being like fixed. No, no. <laughs> no. Not like, uh, no. you know, uh, same old bike, new tire. No, this is uh, <laughs> brand new. You know, this is recreated. This is um, uh, everything that it, it's the best version. You, you can't do better than recreating things from scratch. No so, duct tape. Uh, Right, no duct tape. Um. I like the fact that it says, behold, I make all things new. It's like his first creation was so exquisite. And now he's going to make that creation exactly the way it was supposed to be. Instead of, I'm making new things. You know what I mean? Mm. I'm not right. making new things. He's making all things new. <gasps> yeah. I love that. Hmm. Right. Yeah, because what he created was not evil. It became it was wonderful. Yes, it was wonderful. It became flawed because of sin. But what he created was. So he's not making. Uh, that's an interesting. Yeah, thought there. Yeah, I'm not making all new things. So everything right. brand. I'm making all things new. Brand new. Ah! Yeah, brand new. <laughs> yeah. I like the phrase in verse seven, the one who conquers. So we've seen that over and over again. So it's a, you know, that reminder that we 
or to stay faithful to the end and we will receive the crown of life. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, let me point out something just uh, maybe somewhat random, but when you're speaking to a Jehovah's Witness huh? who would say that Jesus is not God, um, if you quickly scan to Revelation 22, 13, uh, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, beginning and the end. You see it in red letters. Uh, no one would argue that, and, and the Jehovah's Witness would certainly not argue that you know, Jesus said that, uh, especially, um, well, I take that back. They might try to, but later in verse 16, uh, the very next statement is I, Jesus. <laughs> okay. So you really can't make the argument, um, that, that Jesus didn't say those words. Um, and then you go back to 21, uh, six, and, you know, that's, those are words being spoken by God. Mm -hmm. They're not in red letters. And so both God and Jesus are saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Now, Jesus said that way back in Revelation 1, right? He said mm -hmm. that, um, or excuse me, God said that in verse, chapter 1, verse 8. Mm -hmm. I'm the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God. Um, and so you would expect God to then say it again, 21 um, six, but maybe what you don't expect is 22, 13 and 16, Jesus saying the very same thing. So if you just follow that train of thought, that, um, is really difficult for a Jehovah's witness to explain because both God and Jesus are saying the same thing, mm -hmm. which doesn't surprise any of us, but should surprise, uh, them in that, that moment. Um, do they use the same Bible we do? No, but um, their translation, you can go look up the New World Translation online. Um, and I would encourage you to do so. There's nothing wrong checking it out. But you can do so at watchtower.org and look at those, those key verses. And you can see how they try to um, get around that. But they translate it the same way. They translate... Verse 22, 16, I, Jesus, and it's 22, 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega. They would just say that um, the, the statement in chapter 1 and chapter 21 is by God, and so only God can say that he's the beginning and the end. But they can't explain how Jesus then turns around and says that in chapter 22, if that makes sense. <clears throat> I've had that discussion with Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way. <laughs> I think you're a marked man. They put like a little X on your house on the map. They're what they will try, there. yeah. What they will try to do is tell you that chapter 22 and verse 13 is God speaking, not Jesus. That makes sense. And so you're probably not one of their 144,000 either. Yeah. Are they the ones that thought that was a literal number for time? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. thank Jehovah goodness. Witnesses, <laughs> Jehovah Witnesses don't come to my house. <laughs> I think I've been marked with an X too. Don't go there. Right. She's oh, lost. Well. Don't, don't bother. Stop by there, right? <laughs> no, I, I'm Bible something. i not been with the Bible, but with words that I've told them, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, don't be sure. don't be afraid to talk to them. They're uh, wonderful people, and many of them um, believe they're doing what God has called them to do. Yeah. They, many of them also know, you know, the Bible fairly well. You can have a really interesting discussion with them. Unfortunately, some of them know the Bible quite a bit more than Christians, yeah. and so they can present arguments that can be kind of confusing. But uh, if you just speak to them and uh, meet them as you know wherever you can. Um, you can actually prove Jesus is God through their own translation. You just have to be careful because there's going to be certain verses that they're going to translate incorrectly. But mm -hmm. you still there's so many verses that tell us that that you can't get away from that. <laughs> so anyway. So in verse six, something else that sort of stands out to me. Um, I will give from the spring of yeah. the water of life without payment. Mm -hmm. The term without payment is interesting. 
Um, yeah. Why is that necessary? And is there what you know? What what is Jesus conveying there? Well, it could be that we just no longer owe God anything. Right. You know, the uh, price has been paid. Price yeah. has been paid. <clears throat> price has been paid. And that's true today, right? The price mm -hmm. is paid. His right. cross paid it. Yeah. Uh, of course, we'll get to that, um, uh, the river of life um, in chapter 22. But um, yeah, it is an interesting statement without payment. Maybe it's kind of the same thing as grace is also given without payment. Maybe it's just another way of speaking of God's grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is like a fountain of water. Flowing. Uh, yeah, verse seven, the one who conquers, I, to me that that reminds us again of the theme of this whole book. We're to be faithful to the end, you know, Revelation two ten, be faithful to the end, I'll give you the crown of life. Let's be faithful, be faithful, be faithful. The one who conquers is the same kind of statement and uh, we conquer through uh, the testimony of the word. We conquer through our faith and trust in Jesus. And um, here the promise is that the one who is who conquers will be receive that inheritance, um, that that heritage that um, will be a part of the family of God. As opposed to those who are not, verse eight. Uh, which were also spoken of at the end of chapter 20. <laughs> that second death, lake of fire, those, those people will not be. <clears throat> In my commentation down here, it says the spring of water of life is the throne of God and the Lamb. A throne of grace because here the thirst drink without payment by God's free gift. <laughs> yeah, there it is. That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of hard for me to see. Yeah, that's good. I was going back to Revelation 4, that picture, that view of the throne in heaven. Uh, there was described there a sea of glass, so not necessarily a river, but uh, but still kind of the idea of water. But um, this, of course, is a little bit different. Well, aren't seas really salty, and you can't drink them? Maybe it'll be fresh water. And that's everything's fresh. You know? be. Uh, Revelation 21 1 says that the sea was no more. So right. the earth had passed away and there is no more mm -hmm. sea. That, you know, we could view that as water or it may be some sort of Jeez. symbolic interpretation of what the Jews considered Gentiles. Remember, they were like the sea. They were. Um, had no foundation, sw swayed back and forth. They were oppo mm. opposed to God. And so there will be no people who are opposed to God. Yeah. Um, there will be no um, Gentiles in the sense of uh, wicked people or um, those who are not, you know, part of God's people. <clears throat> In the commentaries says the sea was no more does not mean there will be no bodies of water in the new earth earth but refers to the source of earthly rebellion chaos and danger the sea from which the beasts emerge okay. forces of rebellion will no longer threaten creation's perfection i think it says perfection yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. Any know. other thoughts on these opening uh, eight verses here? Yeah. New heavens, new earth. Uh, 
All right, let's continue with the New Jerusalem. So we said earlier um, that, uh, that this is the church. It's God's people. Um, we saw um, a little bit of the description of that when we said that it was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We've seen that um, bride, groom language used to describe the church before, but here we'll see a bunch of more descriptions uh, to help us to see that, uh, that this city is representative of people. So it's not a literal city. We're not going to live within a literal city called Jerusalem, but it's a symbolic representation of the people of God. So let's take a look at that. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and nine through and go ahead and we'll go through uh, 22, five. So, um, yeah, but there, right there, it says it's got walls. Yeah, we'll seen. talk about that. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, I'll start reading and then someone come pick it up. Okay. Perfect. I can't read. I, my eyes can't see this stuff. Patty, no I'm reading for you. Patty, I'm, I'm, I'm now Patty. <laughs> then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a, high, a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the next, one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, in length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. Hmm. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third... Gate, I don't know, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Mm -hmm. That's going to be pretty. <laughs> and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord mm. God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of, the, of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hmm. 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 Alex, you want to do 22, 1 through 5? Yeah, I got you. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and, the, and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. 
and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's take a look at the New Jerusalem. <laughs> And go back to verse 9. Um, so after this appearance of the new heavens, new earth, um, we now see the new Jerusalem. And even just based upon the number of verses dedicated to it, you can tell that's the focus, um, that there's a sense in which, yes, the new, there's a new heavens and new earth, but, oh, take a look at this new city, this new bride, this new wife of the Lamb. <clears throat> Um, so let's take a look and, and see what, what it says here. Uh, as we walk through these opening verses, uh, what stands out to you in the first few verses in this description of this new Jerusalem? We got three sevens in the first verse. All right. And we know from Revelation, what does seven represent? Uh, completeness, uh, wholeness, perfection. Okay, good. I love the statement that the angel ma makes. Come, I will show you. I want to show you something. The bride, the wife of the lamb. <clears throat> yeah, and it also, in, in the Steve Gregory book, um, references how an angel, perhaps the same angel, had also taken him to see the harlot Babylon um, so sort mm. of contrasting mm -hmm. showing you what was and now showing you what is. Mm. A small note, but carried away in the spirit. And so we see the Holy Spirit um, being mentioned here as well. Um, Uh, once again, Jerusalem is coming down from heaven, verse 10, just as it came down from heaven, verse 2. So repetition there. Yeah, and the phrase is having the glory of God, its radiance. I mean, you get a vision of what that might, might be like, very bright, very clean, very um, pure. Sparkly. Sparkly, yes, yeah. sparkly. No glitter, though. <laughs> You're talking about verse uh, 11 there? Yeah. Glory of God, yeah. Because yeah. um, the glory of God was shown in the Old Testament in a number of different ways, you know, when he filled the tabernacle. Um, you know, as a cloud over the mountain. <clears throat> so here his glory is being described in a little bit different way. Yeah, with I reference. like the gates also. You've got gates on every side, the four corners of the world, and there's three gates on each side. So everybody from the four corners of the world is welcome that are believers. Yeah. Um let me give you a couple of quick references that um, that I learned um, from Steve Gregg when I was listening to his commentary on this phrase um, that was brought up just a moment ago that the glory of God. So the church having the glory of God, uh, Romans chapter eight and verse 17, Paul says that if we are, uh, he says we're children of God in verse 16 and then 17 says, and if children, then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Uh, and then in Colossians chapter three and verse four, uh, Paul writes again, he says, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also, then you will also will appear with him in glory. And so, um, 
Paul, speaking of the church, talking about how we will be given that glory of God. <clears throat> so that's some good references there. I noticed also just in that paragraph, including verses 10 through 15, or 10 through 14, rather, uh, the number 12 is used five times. And then if you consider three gates on each of four sides of the building, three times four is another sort of... Um, 12. Yeah. Yeah. Another, yeah. Great point. Yeah. And then we have uh, 12,000 stadia. Right. And they have 144, which is a, um, uh, a factor of 12. Right. And then you have down in 22... Um, 22 2 that it, that the tree yields fruit each month mm. 12 months and mm -hmm. so you're right 12 is found throughout and i think that again is in another indication of people of god people of god people of god yeah the, um, the fruit trees and the you know every month it immediately made me think of fruit of the month club so i think we're going to have a fruit <laughs> of the month club and have it <laughs> Better than Jelly of the Month Club. <laughs> yeah. Fruit of the Month. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. So it's something that also stood out. I had to go look up how many gates there were in the old temple, even though it's, it's saying there's no temple here because God is the temple. But I wondered if there were 12 gates in the old temple, and it says there were only eight. So oh, shoot. For a connection there. But um, I, it did stand out to me, too, that at each of these gates uh, stood angels. And so that made me think of the Garden of Eden. Once they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, Eden cherubim were stationed at the entrances. So they basically, you know, couldn't get back in. So this is a completely different thing. Now, now the, the gates are being uh, manned by angels, which... I assume maybe protects anything impure from coming in, even though all of that's been destroyed. I'm not sure yeah. what the significance of the angels are at the gates. Hmm. I think you're exactly right. And I, in fact, I think the idea of walls um, is not a literal truth, but it's meant to be another reminder of protection. Why were walls built um, around cities? Why was the why were walls placed around Jerusalem? Why were walls placed around any ancient <laughs> city? It was always for protection. And so I think the the message here is that God's people are fully protected. They're going to um, remember John's writing to a culture that um, was still building cities with walls around them. We don't do that today, of course, but. Um, it was always the idea of protection. And so I think you're right, Deb. I think that's a great point. Yeah, I love how the 12 apostles are honored here. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know what is meant by 12 foundations. I don't know how you can have 12 foundations, but you know, on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Well, let me give you a reference to that one. Um, if you look up Ephesians 2, 20 through uh, 22. Uh, Paul says, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong chapter. Oh, 20 yeah. through 22, uh, 20 says, built on the, he's talking about the household of God, verse 19. Um, so God's people, 20, verse <coughs> Uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, uh, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. Uh, he goes on to talk about the structure, but he's talking about the, the church. The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles. And <coughs> so um, the 12 foundations is just a reminder of the 12 uh, apostles that, you know, <coughs> Yeah, and if you were trying to get a literal picture of that, Debbie, the 12 foundations, think about the Wailing Wall. And what you're looking at there is a foundation. Huh. All itself? Uh, it's, it's a foundation on, on which walls were built, I think. I think so. 
I think um, you're right. I think you're right, Denise. Yeah. So the foundations it's, were not necessarily below ground. Right. Um, 16, I find it interesting that John lays out some um, descriptions of the wall and, and the size of the wall. And uh, in a commentary that I have in, in what I've been looking at, it says um, 12,000 furloughs. This would be nearly 1,400 miles cubed or over 2 million square miles offering plenty of room for all the glorified saints. So there you go. If we've got a literal city, it's big. Do you realize how big that is? Think about that. Whew. Yeah, one commentator that I had seen, uh, that's great, Lana. Thank you for sharing that, was that, and I don't know if this is true, but apparently the uh, in the Old Testament, I'd have to go look this up, the Holy of Holies was a cube of 15 by 15 by 15. Yes. yes. And so 1,200 stadia, what I had heard was was roughly 1,500 miles. Uh, mm -hmm. So the idea being that um, whereas before the, in the Holy of Holies, only one person, <laughs> remember, the high priest could go in. Mm -hmm. Now right. all of God's people can, can, can be in the quote unquote Holy of Holies. And so we have the same access That's very as cool. anyone. And so I think the idea seems to be um, at least pointing us back to that Holy of Holies and maybe the general idea that whereas before one, now many. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So you had talked about when they're talking about the city here, which is being described with these walls and the size of the walls and all that kind of stuff. You talked about the new city being the church. Yeah. Are you talking about that being in a literal sense, like a temple? Is this really a city in which people live in, or is this a big old giant temple? I think that this is a picture of God's people represented by a city, not to be taken literal, hmm. but to be taken figurative. And the, the reasons for that, Denise, would be that um, John is told in verses two and nine that this is the bride of Christ. And so that the holy city that comes down from heaven um, to dwell, that it's a picture when, when the, he sees the city come down, but, what he, but the way the city is described, it's, it's, the, it's the bride, it's the, the wife, it's um, those who are <clears throat> all of God's people here being represented as a, um, not as a bride, not only as a bride, but as a holy city. And so I don't think that this is, I don't think that you and I are going to someday live in a city <laughs> when the new heavens and new earth come. Uh, Adam and Eve never lived in a city. Um, I don't know that this is meant to teach us that, but I think it's using the city of Jerusalem to help us to understand what the environment will be like when we are when this does take place and so the walls and the gates and the descriptions of the beauty it's going to be a place of we're going to live in a, in a beautiful world with plenty of protection where there is no pain suffering there is no um, uh, sickness or disease there is no death where god is present with us at all times and in, in all ways uh, to me, this whole picture is is that it's a it's a message about the type of place we will live in uh, when uh, when Jesus returns and the new heavens and new earth has been uh, recreated. Uh, I don't think we're supposed to take this in any kind of literal uh, stance. I don't I don't think that it's going to be a literal 1,500 miles long or 1,500 miles high. I mean, why does it need to be 1,500 miles high? It, I, these are all symbolic to me, um, representing just <laughs> details that teach us about um, really the people um, of God, as well as at times, you know, the general uh, environment we'll live within. <clears throat> well, and the fact that they use 12 or derivatives of 12 so many times, that just uh -huh. re really reinforces that this is meant to be symbolic. Right. Yeah, when I read 22, and it says, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God. 
it, it made me think of the Garden of Eden, right? There was no temple built in that, at least that we're told. Um, but yeah, and, and then it also goes on to say that there's no sun or moon. It's not needed because of God's glory. But we know that the sun and moon were created before Adam and Eve in the garden. So they had a sun and a moon. So um, right. it's similar, but different. And I think it's a both and. I mean, I don't think it's hmm. just God's people. We, we, we do see descriptions which tell us about the type of environment that, that we will live within. I just don't think we're all going to live within a city. Um, I don't think that we're meant to take that from this, but we're just, you know, Jerusalem always was a, was representative of God's people. Mm -hmm. uh, David, the Kings, God's people, the city, even today, right? I mean, you can just tell um, you guys that have been to Jerusalem. Uh, there were many people that, lived in Jerusalem that didn't live within the city walls, but the city in general kind of was the representative of God's people and many times in prophecy and things kind of represented it. And so here, uh, I think John is seeing a picture of this city that he loves, uh, of the place where he had gone so often to pass over and to worship God. And he's seeing this picture of God's people in New Jerusalem um, that represents God's people and the type of environment that um, he will, we will experience. Um, <clears throat> when I look at 23, when I look at 23, it says the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. And immediately I thought, okay, no, wait a minute. When God created the world, he created the sun and the moon because it was necessary for the earth climate and everything it was necessary and it almost makes me think that everything from the moment of genesis 1 culminates now in the believers that will be his forever in heaven like it all had to kind of happen the way it, it was laid out because now you don't need the sun and moon because you got God has glorified everything. He right. is illuminating everything. So I was like, oh, this is the whole story. This is right. the next, the next being. I don't know. Whoa. That's a good Whoa. point. Yeah, that's oh, a good that point. gets very, very deep. Along those same lines that Lana mentions, uh, 22.5 <laughs> says that... <clears throat> and says the you know night will be no more there'll be no need of a lamp or, or the sun mm -hmm. God will be their light it also says too they will reign forever and ever mm -hmm. and so that's why I, another reason for why i think this is a picture of the future church not some sort of church from the past or even the present day church because um it's not a thousand year reign it's a it's not a it's a forever rain and so it seems to point to something still to come that makes sense yeah it's interesting that um the kings of the earth in verse 24 will bring glory bring their glory into it so that i mean jesus is the ultimate king but it sort of implies that you know uh maybe there's still some sort of societal structure um underneath jesus's ultimate kingship i don't know hmm yeah hmm i think it yeah i mean um it says in verse 26 they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations to me um it also kind of represents you know all nations are beautiful and the united states of america is not the only beautiful nation we do some great things but if if you've traveled around the world, you know that, man, you go to Jerusalem, they got some great food and you go to India or you go to every part, part of the world and they all do certain things differently, but there's beauty in a lot of the things that they do and those cultures. And so to me, it's this culmination of all these cultures and um, the goodness of all of them coming together because they're all God's people. Mm -hmm. Anything that honored him now glorifies him together. And so, right um, all right 
Any other things here? I don't, I don't know, honestly. I don't know if you guys saw in any of your commentaries, but what some of the colors and stones represent. I know that um, the high priest in the Old Testament had 12 stones on his um, uh, chest. There was a, you know, he wore a, uh, I forget what it's called, but a piece of jewelry basically had the 12 stones. And so maybe it refers back to that. I'm not sure, but I don't even know what some of those colors are, but it, 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 I'm sure it is beautiful. They're certainly jewels. Um, is that breast, love, breastplate called an ephod or something like that? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that was the 12 tribes of Israel. Each stone was a representative. Right. Yes, very good. <clears throat> and one detail that is interesting that uh, you know, it says in verse 18 that the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Sometimes I think we forget that, you know, even the gold we have is not pure, pure, right. otherwise it'd be right. clear, but it has, um, things within it that, um, uh, that color it and they are, um, imperfections, impurity, impurities of various forms that get into it, cause it to have a, have a color. But this is pure. It's like clear glass. Mm -hmm. um, look, if we've you never look even at, seen that. <laughs> if you look at the gates, the gate is what you enter. Let's just say a fictitious wall here, a city. The gates are what you enter into. The believers, that's where you, uh, you enter in a gate. And I read this. This was interesting. Earthly pearls are formed in response to the wounding of oyster flesh. That's what creates the pearl. And Christ's flesh was wounded for us. Wow. And I think about these gates that you enter into this holy city, you enter in through a huge, big, one big pearl. It's like a picture of Christ and his wounded flesh for us. That's a great analogy. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, because it does say each of the gates are made with a single pearl. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. The cities, mm -hmm. the city uh, streets are also of pure gold. So you can see straight through the, the streets. I don't know how you can tell you're on the street, but I guess you <laughs> no way to... <laughs> <laughs> well, to see that it's gold, it must have some color to it, even if you can see through it. Oh, I hope yeah. I'm not driving on those streets. <laughs> it's like that, uh, what's, that, that colors. what's the tower in Chicago where you can stand out in that, uh, you know, oh, and see yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, the streets Sears. below, it's like the that. Sears tower. <laughs> yeah. Very. Uh, one thing too, you know, the tree of life um, that was found in Genesis two nine, um, and of course that's right. that was the tree that um, they they ate from the forbidden fruit. But that tree of life, there's another um, um, reference going back to Genesis one and two, and just the way things were. So um, we see another picture of that here. He didn't want them to eat of the tree of life, right? When they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he went, uh-oh, we got to keep them out of the garden so they don't take anything from the tree of life, correct? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. The tree yeah. of life, if they ate of it, they would have lived forever. Right. Uh, which in our current state would be not good. Wasn't there two trees in the Garden of Eden, one they were allowed to eat from and one they weren't? There's probably more than two trees, but... Uh, the tree, oh, yeah. Uh, verse 9 the says, uh, the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's, that's sorry, you're right. That's the one they ate of. Thank you for right. So they were allowed to eat from the tree of life, just not the tree of good and evil. Yeah, but not after they ate. 
yeah. not after they ate from the tree of good and evil. Then right. he said, uh -uh, get them out of there. Right. They were kicked out and then banned mm -hmm. from the tree of life. Yes, right. they can so any, any tree but the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. 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 Because before they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they weren't going to die, probably because they were eating out of the tree of life. And then mm -hmm. they took the bad fruit, and Jesus said, oh, don't let him have any of the tree of life. No. So we've got a tree of life yielding 12 kinds of fruit. What kind of fruit is it going to yield? You're That's into the age. fruit, Debbie. I know, I'm into the fruit. <laughs> is yeah. avocado considered a fruit? Is avocado I like considered? avocado. Avocado? I don't know. I, I think so. so. I hope so. It is. Maybe it'll be different for each of us, all our faves. <laughs> I want bananas and avocados. Okay. <laughs> we'll share. <laughs> You're gonna make requests of the tree? <laughs> maybe, the tree, maybe it's kind of like that um those coke machines at Kidoba when you walk up and you can choose from all kinds of different <laughs> like that you can just tell the tree he's like the giving tree remember that book oh <laughs> yeah so 22 4 is maybe my favorite verse in this whole section they will see his face Mm. Would that be something? Mm. Um. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I always picture God sitting on a throne similar to what, like, Abraham Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial. Oh. <laughs> I, I can't help that that picture comes into my mind. Yeah, mine does too, a little bit. I think partially because of the size, it's towering, yeah. you know. Yeah. You finally get to see his face. Yep. Oh my gosh, just think of that. Okay, so um, verse 3 says that um, the servants will worship uh, God. They'll see his face and his name, the name of God, will be on their foreheads. Mm. And so uh, we know what the name of God is. It's the name of Jesus. And so okay. we're all going to have uh, Jesus tattoos on our forehead. I was going to say, doesn't he support <laughs> tattoos? You should have called on that when you preached on hot topics. Tattoos are allowed. We're approved by God. <laughs> allowed to have tattoos if you're a Christian and you put Jesus on your forehead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Would it be presumptuous for us to get that tattoo today? <laughs> I think <laughs> I'm so, just maybe. getting ready here. <laughs> as long as you keep your bangs. Aww. Yeah. Um, Denise and I were doing another study and we were cracking up. We were studying, we're studying how the Bible, how we got the Bible. How we got the Bible. And we got to laughing one night about the rapture, you know, if you believe that sort of view. And so we all decided we were going to pack our rapture bags. We're just going to have our rapture bags on the ready. So when our the go, day comes, our go we, bag, yeah, we don't <laughs> our go bag, our rapture go bag. Huh. You girls. Wow. Oh. I don't think we'll have to have clothes. <laughs> we'll get new garments. Yeah. Well, part of this was coming maybe linked back to a dream I told. The group that I had had, I'd actually had a dream about the rapture. Um, we were in a place that seemed like Jerusalem or some deserty, outposty kind of place. And Ronnie, who I think most of you know, and I mm -hmm. were wearing a, a, a cabin or something, and we, I heard the trumpets go off. <coughs> I was looking out the window, and people were lining up. To go to Jerusalem and Debbie comes running in and says come on we have to go I said well we were just getting ready to pack <laughs> <laughs> and then I woke up and I was so disturbed by the idea that I thought I had to pack <laughs> I really I really contemplated well what is that saying about how I'm thinking that's funny. 
well, it wasn't the rapture. It was the, like the second coming. The trumpets were going off. And... Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Come on, we got to go. I won't leave you behind. I know. All right. Any other final thoughts on this uh, passage? Things that stand out to you? This has been a good discussion. I've been taking all kinds of notes, thinking about what you guys are saying, different insights. Um, so I had this commentary that is about this thick, written by an old guy back in 1710 or something like that, Matthew Henry. Look at that yeah. thing. But I love the, th he says one little thing here at the end of chapter 21. He said, heaven will be free of hypocrites. And I love, I kind of, every time I'm in the New Testament, it seems like Jesus used the word hypocrites a lot. And mm -hmm. I'll go in circle every time I see the word hypocrite. And now it's, we'll be free of the hypocrites. Yay! <laughs> cool. I love that. Yeah. That's good. We don't need those hypocrites. hypocrites. Those actors. Jesus did not like hypocrites. Phonies. Yeah. Yeah. There will be, uh, and that's a good point. There will be truth and honesty, mm. and we won't have to worry about people's. Um, what do they really? What do they really mean when they posted that on Facebook? You know, or whatever. You know, we we will know the people are speaking openly and honestly without fear of um worry or uh yeah <clears throat> okay yeah that's your new rocking chair patty uh no this is that's my old one i tish is over there okay it's a good hey, chair hey debbie did you yeah. do your test today it's at four thirty today. Okay. So. Oh, Ooh. good. I didn't miss a prayer for you today. Few prayers, please, that my yes. brain won't freeze up or explode. I prayed yesterday. I haven't prayed yet today, so I'm praying today. <laughs> Thank you. The Holy Spirit is going to speak for her and pull out all that knowledge that she yes. has studied for and researched and practiced. Yes. I can tell you about years. Augustine and Calvin and Montanism yes. and Nestorius yes. and at least yes, for today. The, after the Reformation start leaking out. <laughs> Say no more. Yeah. You got it, girl. It's at 4 30, right? 4 30. All right. All this to do over a 30 minute oral test. I've got you're gonna blow them away. At least fifty hours worth of study. On oh that. heck, you've got way more than that. Well, at least that I haven't calculated. Well, you know that. now. You know the history, girlfriend. Yeah, for a minute. <laughs> now <laughs> I'll, I'll have recall on some of it, but you'll know. It serves a purpose to test like this. This guy's very passionate about church history, so good for him. Well, you look really cute. So is this how you're going to look for the test? Well, I won't see him, so he won't see my oh, cuteness, shoot. but thank you. <laughs> Darn it. Mm. Well, that's a good prayer request, and uh, we definitely need to pray for uh, for you. and. Well, and you and Alex, too, because you're on top of your own final forms. You got uh -oh. a 20 page All paper. the little students. And okay, Alex has got a couple papers left. Well, Denise has got a couple papers left too. Yeah. yeah. Patty, you and I can play hooky. We have nothing to have to worry about. <laughs> All these little students here, you make us proud. Yeah. Well, you two are students too, and you're tested every single day. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I yes. believe yeah. that. The Jesus. To yeah. that, Patty, right? Yeah. <laughs> every day. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh any other prayer requests uh test today other prayer requests any other things we need to oh, be praying for I, i'm gonna be having a, um, a conversation with one of um just 
one of my students, one of the students in our next gen ministry, um, who he's kind of been in and out just in terms of coming with things, but he's been going through a lot, especially with not being able to come to church, which is a really big part of his routine. And so we're going to talk today because he's just been, uh, he's been struggling. Uh, Aww. Aww. So if you be praying for him. Yes. Yes. And um, by the way, Lana, your yes. Bible bear was precious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hey, Bible Bear. Yes, yeah, that was great. Good job. Mm. You missed your calling. You needed to be like a TV personality for kids. <laughs> 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 you know, Popeye and Janie, it should have said Popeye and, <gasps> and Lanny. Lanny. Yeah, Popeye and Lanny. <laughs> well, we'll do maybe another one next week, Alex. It's for the yeah. Kingdom Kids, so there you yeah. go. Granny yep. Lenny and Cowboy Bob. <laughs> that needs that needs to be that needs to be put in a link in this week's newsletter. Granny Lanny reading. Yeah, and the Bible Bear. Bible Bear. Bible proclaim bear. the name of Jesus or <laughs> proclaim Jesus today. Yeah. I wonder how many of those we're getting. Have you looked at that, Josh? Hmm. What's that? the uh hashtags of proclaim Jesus. Proclaim Jesus today. I've seen I've seen a few. Uh I saw some yeah. I don't know the number. I need to look that up. If you go into Facebook you can type that in and you should be able to pull up any that yeah. I've used recently. I do you have to do that individually with Instagram and Twitter or does it give you the count across all social media? Uh I would think you have to do it in within each, but right. I don't know that for sure I guess. I've done it in Facebook, and I thought we had about five, and it seemed to only be on Facebook, not Instagram and other things. Yeah. Let's see. <clears throat> I definitely see more than five. You do? Mm -hmm. Well, there were some from, like, people not from our church that were several years old, so. Oh. Do you see I that? Like well, let me. Yeah. Well, it's only Wednesday, so we just need to get out there and start posting. That's hey, right. We challenged our life group last night for everybody to make a video, to read a scripture, to share some devotional thoughts. And Patty, see how she's even shaking her head up and down? She said, I'm going to be first in line. She's going to do it. Yeah. From see, the garage. You, can, you, can have, you can have John sit next to you and really? you can just read to him. Yeah. Wow. And put the camera on his face so we can see his reaction as you're reading. Oh, no. You don't have to be on the camera. <laughs> no. He can sit in the other rocking chair. You guys can have a, a rock and Bible, Bible sharing moment. Oh, he won't do that. He won't do that. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right. Um... Lana, would you mind closing us in prayer? Absolutely. All right, thank you. Father God, oh Lord Jesus, we come to you with just humble hearts, humble minds, because you take us and you mold us exactly the way you want us, Father. Thank you for that. Remove any fear or concerns. Instead, Father, just fill us with your peace you are the good shepherd, Lord, and you've taught us that over and over again. And we're like your little toddlers. You know we'll need to hear it again, and you're ready to tell us. Thank you, Father, for always being there. Lord Jesus, we just lift all of our students up today, our adult students in Bible college, Father. You are preparing them to proclaim you in so many ways, Father. We just ask today that they accomplish those things that need to be accomplished today with the help of your Holy Spirit, bringing recall and perfect words. And dear Lord, we just thank you for the fountain. Thank you for the church that is just yours, Father. Um, it is a precious, precious stone. And Father, we just love you for creating us into the perfect stones you want us to be, the, the beautiful gold, the, the beauty of, of what is told we'll see and be when we are with you forever, Father. And we just thank you for that. Thank you for Josh and, and the worship team that worked so hard to create worship online, Father. We just thank you, empower them in every single way, Father. 
that their job is easy because they're proclaiming you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lana.